Hi everyone, welcome back to the Creative Exploration series. This week I am doing an interview with a good friend of mine, Scott Lawler. We've been friends on Twitter for a couple years now, and honestly, we've been planning on trying to set this up for probably nine months to a year. Uh, unfortunately, our schedules never really uh, coincided, so I sent him a bunch of questions and he responded, and um, now I'm kind of stitching it all together, which I think is still very valuable. He has some really great insights in this. Um, so these artist interviews are a way to look at the creative process from a very different perspective and learn how someone else handles and overcomes problems. I feel that this is incredibly valuable. You don't want to just hear my opinions on everything. In this episode, I explore some really interesting topics with Scott, including overcoming just some limitations, including physical limitations, but also mental ones, and just kind of how to manage your time and um, just be prolific when you, when you create stuff. In the video description below, you'll find links to a lot of Scott's stuff, so I highly suggest you check it out and listen to his massive collection of music. He probably puts something new out every couple days. So I'll move on with the interview, but first I want to thank all of my incredible Patreon subscribers who help make this video series possible. Thank you guys so much. So first and foremost, Scott, hi. Thank you so much for uh, showing up on this show, and I'm really looking forward to talking to you a little bit more. Hi, Ben. Thanks for having me on the Creative Exploration Series. I know that we've both been looking forward to doing this episode for quite a while. And, you know, projects come up and people get sidetracked and that kind of thing happens to me. So I really appreciate you having me on the program. Absolutely, absolutely. So who are you and where can we find more of your stuff? If, if somebody doesn't really know anything about you, where should they look? Well, my name is Scott Lawler. I am an ambient artist who lives in North Texas, and you can find my pretty varied catalog at scottlawler.bandcamp.com. I also have some items available on other digital platforms, such as iTunes and Amazon, Spotify, and those kinds of things. But most of my music is on my primary Bandcamp site. You can also find me at Twitter, if you would like to follow me there at Scott Lawler 12. Yeah, definitely. I feel that Twitter is, is very important for pretty much every uh, independent musician these days. So what compelled you to start writing music in the first place? I've always been interested in music ever since I was a little kid. I used to play around uh, on the piano in my aunt's basement in, at Cape Cod in Massachusetts. And when I was six or seven, my parents got me a little toy organ and a little drum set that I used to play. And I always used to play around with uh, record players and tape recorders, and I would make all these weird sound collages from different, from different albums and stuff like that. And I'll always remember one time my mom told me when I was two years old, I demolished her Elvis collection using a talking book player. Now, for those who don't know, a talking book player is a special machine that they used to use, uh, that blind people used to use to listen to talking books, which were, which were records uh, from the Library of Congress where authors, where narrators would uh, read a, a pretty good number of popular books. I guess the analogy now would be the, the digital talking books that you can get from places like Audible, um, and those kinds of things. But yeah, apparently I just put her Elvis records on the machine. And I just started, you know, playing DJ, scratching the records and, you know, doing those DJ scratches and stuff like that. And she was not happy, obviously. And that collection probably would have been worth a good bit of money had I not done that kind of thing uh, when I was two. Oh, man. Uh, <laughs> I have a similar story. I, uh, I accidentally flooded the basement one time in one of our older houses, and unfortunately that destroyed my dad's entire record collection uh, because he had them mostly on the bottom shelf. Uh, I didn't realize how devastating that probably was to him until I was much, much older, and I still feel bad about that. Um, so when you started out, was there anyone that you really looked up to or emulated? 
When I started composing music back around 1991, I was inspired a lot uh, by people like Suzanne Chani, uh, Yanni, and Liz Story, and people like that. In fact, Suzanne Chani and I, in the mid-90s, we communicated a little bit on CompuServe, and she told me one of the stories behind probably my favorite song of hers, which is called... It's called Riding Heaven's Wave, Eulogy to a Surfer. It's from her 1995 album called Dream Suite, which is an album that she created with the uh, Young Persons Moscow Orchestra, a 70-piece orchestra from, uh, from Moscow. That's probably my favorite album by her. And she was a big inspiration in my early days because back in the early 90s, I wrote a lot of New Age uh, music. And my album, Show Me the Glint of Light, that I came out with last year, goes back to those early roots of when I first started composing. You see, that's really interesting. I love hearing where people came from almost more than I like hearing where they plan on going in the future. I think it's so cool to hear like all of the all of the stuff that happened way long ago that that kind of formulated where where you are now. I think that it's really, really cool. So what is your day-to-day process when it comes to creating music? My day-to-day process when it comes to making music is actually pretty simple. I actually don't write music every day, although I probably should, but sometimes I just don't feel like it. I'm not very motivated. But it's pretty easy. All I do basically is... I've already got everything set up. The computer's plugged into my keyboard. All I do is bring up SoundForge, hit record, and I just start playing. And most of the time, um, I don't do a lot of overdubs, recording different tracks and stuff like that. I just record one track and one take. And that's usually what I release because I want the essence of the moment to be something that the listener also I don't know how I want to put that I want the listener to to be able to experience that as well so a lot of what I do is just a one-off improvisations I really like that style I I feel that it seems that like overproduction is something that definitely happens uh, right now in the in the world of music that people focus so much on making everything quote unquote perfect where they don't always realize that the act of just creating or improvising can be perfection in its own way now, it's not perfection technically but it's in the moment it's important in that way so how do you keep yourself on task um that's not really a question I'd know how to answer because I don't get, well, I get distracted sometimes. But the things I get distracted from are more, more the mundane stuff that I have to do around the house. But when it comes to my music and, and composing and stuff like that, I usually do a lot of that at night after everybody else goes to bed. And when it's all quiet, and yeah, it's quiet during the day because the kids are in school and I'm a stay at home dad, but. Sometimes I just you know, listen to other music, you know, listen to classical or, or things that other friends send me that they want me to hear and, and stuff like that. And you know, I play around on Twitter a little bit here and there and get some stuff done around the house. But the night is the most inspirational for me. So I re- record and play most of my music at that time. And it's pretty easy for me to stay on task because once I start recording, I just... I don't get distracted uh, when I'm when I'm playing. Yeah, I completely understand that. It's so easy to get into a flow state like that, especially if you're working more on the improvised stuff and you're you're just focused on creating the best thing you can because that's what's being recorded at the time. I I really like that uh, that process that you have, especially working at night. You can just focus. So, what is the biggest problem that you've been running into lately, and what have you been doing to overcome it? The biggest problem I have been running into lately, and I'm not really sure if lately is a a good word to use that because I've always had this problem, 
And um, that problem is coming up with song titles. <laughs> song titles are usually a difficult thing for me to come up with unless I'm writing an, an, an album that's a concept album. Um, well, even concept albums, I some, sometimes have problems coming up with, uh, with titles, but it, it's a little easier because I've got the, the, framework, the framework of the concept to use as a guide for, for whatever titles I want to use to tell the story that I'm trying to relay in the music that I write. But if it's just an album of, of regular songs, uh, unless it's something from like the Navy or Haiku Project, because I write a lot, of, a, lot of, a, lot of, a lot of albums that are inspired by the Navy or Haiku Project, those titles are easy. In fact, the title comes up usually bef- sometimes before the music, sometimes after I've written the music. Like I write something like from 2015, and I'll get a haiku from like 2017, and I'll listen to that haiku, and I'm like, oh, this piece from 2015 fits the mood of that haiku, so I'll use that as the title for that track. Never mind the incontinuity between when the haiku came out and when that track was written. I mean, nobody even cares about that anyway, probably. <laughs> but, um, yeah, sometimes it's, it's hard for me to come up with titles, and so what I'll do is um, I'll listen back to what I wrote, and sometimes I'll just start surfing the net and I'll start reading articles or reading things on Wikipedia. And if I find something that seems to strike the mood that I'm feeling when I'm listening to that track, I may borrow a phrase from that uh, piece of literature or that, that article or whatever as a, um, as a title. That's a really good idea. I like that a lot. Sometimes I ask people for help with titles. Wings of an Angel sometimes gives me titles for some of my songs some of my albums, stuff like that. Uh, the other challenge for me, uh, since I'm blind, I don't do my own artwork. So getting artwork for stuff, it's not really a challenge. It just takes longer than it would for a lot of other people. But the artwork that I get is really pretty good. Bill Helms who I met on the Ambient Online forum, uh, does stellar artwork. He's done artwork for a lot of my albums. Uh, let me list some of the albums that he's done the artwork for. Let's see, he did the artwork for Child of Rage, which is one of my favorite albums. Uh, he did the artwork artwork for my new album that I just re- released for the Eclipse called Within the Path of Totality. He has done artwork for so many of my albums. I can't listen. I have to go back to the site and actually look and figure that out. I believe he also did the artwork for Beyond the Boots Void, which is my most popular album on Bandcamp. It's a five-hour album. That came out in 2015. (laughs) Five hours. That's that's crazy. (laughs) Um, Wings of an Angel does the artwork artwork for some of my albums. And some of the albums that I have, I get artwork for from the Divinity Library, which is a, it's a, religious, it's a religious website where they have uh, readings for the liturgy, uh, readings for the season of Lent, for the season of Advent, uh, Pentecost, uh, Easter, all these other different religious holidays. And even though, even though I'm not religious, um, I don't subscribe to any particular overtly religious teaching, whether it be Protestantism, Catholicism, uh, Islam, Buddhism, uh, Shintoism, Hinduism, uh, even the flying spaghetti monster is a, it's a bit ridiculous, but I don't describe to any of that stuff. But the artwork that they have, I sometimes use for some of my albums. And some of my album titles actually come from different religious texts that I've read. Because you know, when, I was, when I was in school, I had to take Old and New Testament studies. Because I went to a Southern Baptist school, even though I grew up Catholic. So that was a strange, strange experience. Here's this Catholic guy trying to talk to fundamentalists about religion, and it it just got a little interesting. But then I went to a Catholic university for grad school, and then after that I began to embrace, like, the New Age movement, and I eventually settled on uh, deism belief system, pretty much, you know, the idea of God being a, a clockmaker, and he just wound up the universe and just let it run with no intervention. And I don't even know how we got from there to here, but, <laughs> but sometimes that happens with these, with these discussions. Oh yeah, definitely. That's why I like doing these. You ask one question, and I answer that question, and then um, just something else goes way off into another another tangent. 
Yeah, and I think these tangents are valuable. That uh, that that's why these interviews and discussions are so fun because it kind of sees more facets to the artist rather than just what they produce. So you mentioned your blindness. What tools do you use to work within those constraints? Um, to work with my blindness, being being a blind musician, I basically use SoundForge. I use Audacity. On my computer, I've got a screen reader, which is an adaptive piece of software that reads aloud uh, the text on the screen. Now, there are a lot of blind musicians who use something called Complete. And I know you, you've probably heard of Complete. It's, it's by Native Instruments. And the newest version, or well, since version 11, it's been made accessible so that if, you've get, if you get one of the Complete uh, Series S controllers, control keyboards, which if I got one, I would get the 88 key because I just like having that many keys, especially since I do a lot of piano work. All of the menus and everything else talk on those machines. So you can have access to a lot of different instruments and have access to all the different parameters. And you can, I guess, do sound design pretty well with those kind of things. But I'm a little nervous about even approaching the idea of utilizing virtual instruments exclusively. I'm, I'm a hardware guy. I came from hardware. I still use hardware, and I know hardware doesn't have all the same universal NKS standards uh, that the that the software has. Yeah, but that physicality is so nice when you're working. I like twiddling knobs and, and pushing buttons and and stuff like that. I was going to say, maybe, maybe if those machines had more knobs, I might consider it, but I don't know. Basically, I guess it's got six knobs, and all those knobs do different things depending on what menu you're in and those kinds of things. But, you know, I would probably get lost being in all that stuff because it would just be too much for me to handle probably too many too many options i don't do well with a lot of options that's just not my strong suit i don't a couple of options are good but don't give me too many because then i won't make any decision decisions at all <laughs> yeah and there are a lot of people in my life who can attest to that particular way oh, that I am. Yeah, no, I completely agree that having those limitations when, with creative work is, is very important on allowing you to focus on new and interesting things. So how do you think that this affects your workflow and output compared to other musicians that are out there? Well, I think my disability probably affects my workflow and how I work compared to other musicians because I have to do things a little differently sometimes probably sometimes I probably have to take a long way around to do something that a sighted person would have to do let's use preverb as an example you know what preverb is it's the idea that the reverb the reverb comes in before the sound that was pretty popular back in like the 80s oh yeah I remember that um Rush used that a good bit, especially on tracks like Natural Science and from their Permanent Waves album and stuff like that. If you want a preverb effect, you can probably just find a plugin that will do that, do the whole thing automatically for you. Just select the sound and it'll probably create the the preverb effect for you right there with no with no additional fiddling around with any controls or parameters or anything but for me i don't know for sure that this is the case but if i use something like reaper and maybe other digital audio workstations those kind of plugins might be a little more accessible to me but i just haven't been interested in doing that i'd rather work on art than learn a whole lot of new technology and stuff like that besides the, the workflow i have seems to work pretty well but yeah like for a preverb i'll just i will reverse the sound with uh, you know sound forge or whatever then I'll manually add a reverb then I'll add some silence forever needs to go I can't remember exactly but I do all that stuff manually I reverse add reverb then reverse again and do all this other stuff manually that you would probably just be able to do with one plugin selecting a particular plugin and just hitting render or or apply or whatever but I've gotten pretty fast at doing the things that I need to do to get around whatever limitations that people might believe that I have, if that makes any sense. Oh, yeah, definitely. So my workflow is pretty efficient. It 
it seems to work pretty well for me, I think. Well, clearly, considering you have released so many albums over the past couple of years, it's, it's kind of crazy. I mean, what, what projects have you been working on lately? What projects have I worked on lately? Well, there have been a lot of them, um, <clears throat> obviously. I just finished up a couple of collaborations with Wings of an Angel over the last month or so. The last one's called Asylum Liturgy. He wanted me to do something with MIDI. I don't usually do a whole lot with MIDI, but I've got a little program called QWS, which stands for Quick Windows Sequencer, which allows me to, to record MIDI. And um, so I'll record him a MIDI track of something, maybe piano or whatever. It doesn't really even matter what instrument it is because MIDI is just events anyway. And so I'll record a track of MIDI events that's maybe five, five or six minutes long. He'll take, he'll take that MIDI data and import it and do whatever he does to make it phenomenal, really. Um, we've got a couple of albums of that kind of thing that will be coming out in 2018 as well. Do we have one later this year? I can't remember. I know we've got two more collaborations planned for 2017. And um, what other projects do I have going? There's this really dark ambient album I want to release, stuff that I wrote back in, I think it was October 2015, maybe. Maybe it was, maybe it was October of 2016, I can't remember. The album is called The Messenger, and it's uh, all of the song titles are taken, taken from this poem called The Messenger. I'll probably release that sometime in October. <laughs> well, since this interview is coming out so late, it's probably already out. I'll, I'll link that in the description below. So what is one of the main reasons you think why people fail while writing music? That's an interesting question. One that I've never really given any thought to. I think that maybe people are probably, they're either too critical of themselves or they too readily believe the negative criticisms of other people. And I think once you start to believe those things, it's pretty quick to internalize that. And when you do that, that can be a big factor in losing your motivation to create. Because you're probably thinking, well, people don't like my stuff anyway, so why the hell should I even try? <laughs> yeah. And um, I think that's a I think that can be a big problem for people. Yeah, I agree that uh, art should be made for the artists and like other people's enjoyment is kind of like a byproduct of that. Um, that I think that's a really important idea to internalize. So if you only had $100 and wanted to start writing music, what would you buy? I would probably, <laughs> what would I buy? I guess as a hardware junkie, this might be a bit of a harder question for you compared to some of the artists I've talked to. Well, I guess that question is assuming that you already have a computer, mm. or maybe no, because if you don't have anything and you just start out with like one hundred dollars, I guess you could get something like a um, a, um, a a cassette recorder, a microphone, and just start recording stuff around your house, record stuff in your kitchen or or any other room. The kitchen is a fun place to record stuff because you got pots and pans in there, you got lids, you could spin a lid on the floor and make a really cool sound out of that. Well, though, you'd have to have VSTs and stuff. But if the $100 allowance is assuming that you've already got a computer, then, you know, you, the sky is really still the limit because a lot of VSTs are free. You could use something like Audacity with a, even like a USB microphone if you wanted to, you know, record different, um, different sound events that happen in your house. I've got tons of files of like me with the kids, and sometimes I use those in different recordings. My album, Dark Mind, has a recording of Leah somewhere in there. Uh, my album, 216-18666-18216, has Leah a good bit. On, well, on some tracks, anyway. But yeah, you could just record stuff in your kitchen. You could record your coffee maker. You could record your dishwasher. Oh, man, we had a dishwasher back in, in this one dump that we lived in. <laughs> it was the squeakiest, creakiest old thing. When you would pull open the dishwasher door and pull out the racks, they would make this horrible squeaking noise. And I was like, you know, that is a fantastic sound. I could do all kinds of cool stuff with that, but I never recorded it. Um, 
and then we got rid of that dishwasher when we got when we got a new one. But yeah, if you want a hundred bucks, and that's all you could spend, you know, you get yourself a microphone. You know, use your laptop. Use something like Audacity. You want to use something portable that you can carry around and set up in different places. But yeah, set it up in your kitchen. Or record record yourself making the morning's coffee or record yourself spinning some pot lids on the floor. Um, you know, if you have a kid, let your kid play drums with some spoons and some pots and pans. It'll, it'll drive you crazy, but if you record <laughs> all that, you could use VSTs and other things with a free program like Audacity, and you could create some really amazing dark ambient uh, material from those simple field recordings that you just record yeah. within the confines of your kitchen. Yeah, I think that it's really important to use found sounds and stuff that you've made because it gives that personal touch. And, and like those those sounds might not be perfect, but they're yours and they're unique. And I think that that actually lends a lot of value to the, to the music that comes out of it. I mean, I've done that before. I've, I've recorded several albums of things from samples that people have put online. Well, we have a collaboration. What I just re-released it on my Bandcamp page a couple, of, like last week, and it's got a Latin title. Um, and that is done from just voicemail recordings that a friend of mine recorded for me, and she gave she gave him and I permission to use those voicemail recordings to create a themed uh, dark ambient concept album. And. Um, I was involved with the one sample dare challenge for quite a while, so I amassed a pretty good collection of of tracks that I recorded from doing that every couple of weeks. And um, one of the tracks that I came up with, I don't know what I'm going to call it yet, but it was recorded from a sample of some workmen breaking windows in our house. And they were breaking windows in our house because they were replacing the yeah. old windows with new windows. But they had to break out all the glass from the old windows, obviously, and take out the frames and everything. So I just recorded them breaking the glass on one of the windows. I think it was an upstairs window. And uh, I took that sound of them breaking glass. You could hear the hammer and the glass breaking and things landing on the dirt outside and everything. And uh, I just took all that and recorded a song. That's super cool. I I absolutely love doing stuff like that. It's it's always fun to get unique sounds and see what you can do with them in the long run. So are there any mistakes that you've made that have helped you grow as an artist? Yes. Improvising without first hitting record. Uh, <laughs> I think everyone's probably done that once or twice. Um, it, it makes you more conscious to try to make sure that you hit that record button before you play anything because you never know how something's going to turn out, especially if you just do a lot of improvising. If you just sit at your keyboard and play without thinking about it and what you record, what you played was really cool and then you discovered that you didn't hit the record button, that can be a pretty disappointing experience. Yeah, that's devastating. Um, what other what other mistakes? I'm sure I've made other. I'm sure, I've made other mistakes along the way. Everyone has. I allowed someone to do a hatchet job on some liner notes that I recorded that I wrote up for an album. That was pretty disappointing. I um, wish I had been a little bit more assertive in that and said no. You're not going to change my liner notes for this album, even if you don't believe everything that I've written in these notes for this recording so that I can release it on your label. If you want to do that, then I'll just find somewhere else to release it. But, you know, at the time, I wasn't really... I hadn't had my own band camp set up at that point. I had just been starting to release music on labels, or I'd been releasing stuff on labels for like a year, maybe. But I still wasn't really self-published. And... At the time, I was thinking, well, the important thing really isn't the liner notes, it's the music, and I just want the music to get out there so people can hear it. That's what my objective was. But I was still disappointed at the at the hatchet job. Eventually, I reissued the album on my band camp with the unedited, correct version and much better version of those <laughs> liner notes. Yeah, the director's cut. But that's just... That was just a, a situation where I needed to just be more assertive and say, no, you're not going to change my liner notes that I worked hard on for this album, which I think bring out what the album really means and stuff like that. 
so I should have just been more assertive in that, but I have some issues with being assertive as it is, so um, that's probably just a continual work in progress. Well, I know that many artist types are, are much more introverted than extroverted, so it's it's very easy to kind of go with whatever flow other people set, and that might not always be the right thing for the art, but it's a lot easier. I, I've definitely had that problem in the past, too. So what's one thing that would make you feel like you made it, aside from financial stability? One thing that I think would help me feel like I've made it, so to speak, um, would be probably to have my music in a horror movie. Oh, that's cool. Um, that would be really cool, because a lot of people tell me that my stuff uh, would work uh, really well in those kinds of movies. I mean, I would I would settle for being in an independent film. In fact, I would rather probably do that than to be like in a main blockbuster Hollywood film because I don't really <laughs> want much to do with the Hollywood and all that. And people who write music for films, I mean, the Hollywood market is probably saturated with tons of people who want to write movies or want to write scores for them. And they got their couple of guys that they go to. Uh, Hans Zimmer comes to mind and uh, Thomas Newman... Uh, he's the guy who did the score for uh, Shawshank Redemption and uh, The Green Mile. I think he probably also did the music f for Finding Nemo. He's got a very distinct uh, signature, a uh, very distinct sound. You can pretty much tell his soundtracks. Um, but he's a good composer, too. I like his music. But yeah, if I could be, if my music were in the background for a... Uh, I don't know, a B movie or a, a, a B horror movie or something, a local film festival. That would be pretty cool because my wife, you know, she even tells people you know, when they say, when they ask her, what does your husband do for a living? She says, he's a stay at home dad who writes music for horror movies. So that's what I tell people too. Even though none of my music is really in horror movies, it could be. So I just say that I write music for horror movies oh, because yeah. Yeah. it could be that way. Oh, definitely. And I mean, that's the intent of the music that you're writing. So uh, I, I would say the same thing. I think that that makes perfect sense. So do you have any resources that you use that you can recommend for people to check out? I recommend the ambientonline.org forum. It's a really great forum. I would check that out. There are a lot of groups on Facebook, although Facebook groups, there is so much. And I'm guilty of this, too. I know I am. People just go in, leave links for albums or tracks, and don't really interact with people. <laughs> yeah. So I probably would recommend Facebook as a resource. But um, yeah, the Ambient Online form is a really good, really good form. They've got a lot of different sub forms in there. There's one for the One Sample Day or Challenges. There's one for new releases. There's one for um, hardware. Even a ambient, even a um, a guitar ambient f form which is really cool. So it's just an amazing form. They even have the Ambient Online podcast, which I don't think has been updated for quite a while, but it's still a really good podcast. I was interviewed on, I think it was episode 39. Oh, nice. I'll have to check that out. Of that show. I think it was my first interview, actually, back in 2014. I think it was 2014 when I was interviewed on that show. Another good resource for if you're a musician and you're looking to get some of your music reviewed now I know this is a bit of a controversial point and some people say don't do it but people who um, who pay to review your music I don't think that's a bad thing necessarily and I know some people their first thought is well wouldn't you rather have an honest review than a paid review but just because you pay someone to write a review of your music doesn't mean that they're not going to be honest because the people who write good music reviews are the people who take a lot of time to listen to the music that you've given give them. They probably take, probably listen to it two or three times. And in my case, depending on what I submit, that can add up to hours of time already. Then they have to write the review, and that takes a lot of time too, and you know, formatting and everything else. So I think people who write reviews should get the same support that independent artists who make, their, who make the music that they review also get because they're providing a service as well. I guess I never really thought about it like that. They're providing you a review of your music. Now, if you think honesty and monetization are mutually exclusive, you know, then maybe 
maybe that's not, not something you, that you want to that you want to do but you know there are a lot of sites where people will will review your music and you got to pay them something because it, it takes them a lot of time to do that uh, journeyscapes comes to mind as one um, another one is uh, one world music UK out of uh, out of the UK obviously with Steve and Chrissy Shepard they're really good to work with they provide a really good uh, quality product and the other thing is they'll put your reviews if your music is on Amazon or and iTunes they'll put your reviews up there too so that can help draw in exposure for your album because how many people will probably go to read a review for an album before they even download it and listen to it I mean especially if they have to pay for it if it's like name your own price and people probably don't even they just download it anyway but I don't know. I think those pay, pay to review options are good ones. And uh, integrity and not accepting money for a review, they're, they're, not, they're not necessarily exclusive. Just because you request that people pay for your services doesn't mean that you're not being honest in your assessment of what you're reviewing. So that's my thoughts on on some resources, which again, we got off into another, another topic, I suppose. But yeah, but I think that it's really important. I'm going to have to consider that stuff more in the future. I think that's the thing I like about these interviews. Sometimes you just go off on different tangents and you talk about things that you didn't even really think you were going to talk about. And that's, <laughs> yeah. That's a pretty cool thing. Yeah, definitely. And that's why I love doing these interviews as well, because it allows you to go off on these tangents. I think that it's incredibly valuable to have that kind of insight. So thank you again, Scott, for chatting with me. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, before we wrap up, I wanted to give you another opportunity to let people know where they can find you online. And um, yeah, go for it. If you want to find, if you want to stream and or purchase my music, you can go to Scott Lawler. That's S-C-O-T-T-L-A-W-L-O-R dot bandcamp dot com. You can find my music there. Some of my albums are Name Your Own Price. Not a lot of them, but some of them are. Some of the collaborations are Name Your Own Price and things like that. But I've got a lot of, a lot of different things on my uh, Bandcamp page. Uh, the styles range from dark ambient, you know, cosmic space music, um, new age, a little bit of Berlin school here and there, a lot of drone and minimal, minimalism, uh, even some noise. You've got some noise stuff up there under my own name and also under a, a side project that I have up, up there, too. I'm also on Twitter. If you want to find me there, it's scottlawler12. I deleted my old, my old Twitter account because it was just getting too noisy, oh, yeah, too much that. political stuff. And yeah, I still follow some political people, but not nearly as many as I used to before. And it just got to be where I had way too many bots and stuff following my account because I, I just wouldn't it would say somebody wanted to follow me, and I, I was too lazy to just go through and clean all that up so that it would just be easier to delete that account and start another one and so i did that so yeah it's uh scott lawler 12 and where else can you find me my music is also some of it is on itunes uh, amazon spotify and uh, places like that so that's where people can find me and i appreciate you taking the time to uh interview me for oh, the yeah for the program yeah of course i know we've both been looking forward to doing this for quite a while <laughs> and i'm glad that it's that we have finally been able to uh been able to do yeah, that yeah definitely i really appreciate you coming on and it's great to have talked to you uh thank you again for your time and i'm sure we'll chat later